Good morning, and welcome to episode two of Let's Unpack This, where the best minds of the new school talk about the upcoming 2020 election. This morning, post uh, last night's first debate of the Democratic contenders, I am here with Natalia Petrozella and Teresa Gilarducci. Natalia is the Associate Professor of History at Lang College, and Teresa is a Professor of Economics at the uh, NSSR Schwartz Center for Economic Policy. Thank you both for joining us so Thank much. Thank you for having me. Um, so let's start by talking about who, who won the debate last night and who stood out most to you of all the candidates on stage. I think those might be two different questions, but to answer them quickly, I would say that the one who stood out to me most was Julian Castro, I think because he hasn't gotten much attention and he was um, pointed and smart and just, I thought it was very clear that he has probably d deserved to get more attention in the run-up. Did he win? It's hard to say with 10 people who won. I mean, Senator Warren was a favorite and I thought she did amazingly. So yeah, there's that. Um, you know, it was a job interview, what we saw. Yeah, true. Um, but there were many jobs that people were applying for. So who, to me, stood out as uh, applying for the job as president, or, may, or more specifically, our Democratic candidate that can beat Trump? was actually Amy Klobuchar. Hmm. If you go down the road and ask who can do the job that's very specific here to, um, to win against Trump, and you look at the 2016 election and you look at the 2018 election, and you look at the congressional districts that flipped, and you looked at the voters who moved and the voters who came out, it was suburban women, it was working class people in those districts in in, um, in New Jersey that flipped from red to blue, and those districts in Pennsylvania that flipped from uh, red to blue, those were, um, those were Midwestern voters. So in terms of that job, mm -hmm. I do think Amy Klobuchar um, did stand out as someone who could be a credible candidate against Trump in a way that Julian Castro did not stand out Right. In some ways, Julian Castro stood out because he sort of, you know, came out of nowhere for a lot of people, I think. He didn't really come out of nowhere, but in terms of the national press coverage, absolutely. I think Klobuchar as well. I mean, the people that I were watching with were like, wow, wow. And she managed to both be kind of collaborative in her statements, but also combative. I mean, I thought that the moment when she responded to Jay Inslee, right, when he, and when she mentioned about oh, reproductive yeah. rights, you know, there have been a few women up here working on that issue and before. Yeah, and I thought that mix of being collaborative and calling out in a positive way the achievements of her colleagues while also not being afraid to say, to kind of put someone in his place, I thought that was really impressive and, and speaks to the, someone who could be an executive. Well, that's yeah. really good, Natalia. If we can think about who really showed um, the, the kind of skills that mm -hmm. you need as a president or as a party leader, that really came out because yeah. she said, oh, by the way, we're all here together. Yes. And there were those... If I can just change the subject. Oh, please. There were just moments there um, last night where I felt, wow, there is a party filled with values and a history and a future represented here. Some of them are going to be future senators, cabinet members. Mm -hmm. some, some of them are running for vice president. Or one or two are running for president. And we have a party here that I could almost see myself re-energizing myself and, and going to my neighborhood party um, meeting. Yeah, I think that that's a really good point. I mean, so many people, it's very, I think, tempting to kind of point to the dumpster fire of the Democratic Party, and we have 20 people up there, and like, God, they couldn't get it together to beat Donald Trump. But I agree that last night, there did seem to be a kind of coherence of party around some major issues, even as there was distinction, there were, you know, distinctions. But also, I was impressed and sort of surprised to see a kind of shared movement to the left among a lot of them talking about free college is like a serious issue is a community college or is it all higher ed but something that everyone saw worth talking about the border as a moral failure the board the situation at the border right now across the board and I thought that um, I agree it spoke to like wow the Democrats are coming together around something and that is inspiring I believe I agree the future yeah which is that it's going to be not only demography is moving towards yep. uh, um, Spanish-speaking people but the electorate is. Mm -hmm. um, and and remember the, um, the Senate races that are going to be yeah. up and pulled up by the, the, top of, the candidate on the top of the ticket is Arizona and Colorado. 
Like if we have any hope of winning the Senate, it's going to be those two states. Mm -hmm. And um, given how close the challenge to Ted Cruz and the Senate was, um, there may be a challenge to the um, to yeah. the um, to the, to the Senate race in in Texas. So those are all those can't win for the Democrats unless um, um, Spanish-speaking voters actually vote. Yeah. Well, I love that you you both seem to be touching on sort of strategic points of mm -hmm. winning, which mm -hmm. I think often, uh, I, I don't think, like I wasn't thinking about that last mm -hmm. night when I was watching the debate. I was sort of pulled in by the, the various narratives um, being projected of the candidates. Yeah. But it, I will say that I feel like across the board, I was so proud of yeah. everyone. It was it was quite nice yeah. to, to sort of take a step back and, and remind myself, this is this is our the future of this party and, mm -hmm. and everyone is yeah. is speaking to incredible issues i mean uh to to pivot a bit let's talk about the fact that three of the candidates on stage were speaking spanish mm -hmm. uh, natalia would you like to yes that? that was i think i think i maybe like tweeted all caps about that because <laughs> i thought that that was a remarkable thing i mean i thought both the fact that you know a couple of the candidates beginning with beto um thought that it was attractive on a kind of national stage to show that they could speak Spanish as opposed to, you know, speaking just when they're on the stump in a Latino neighborhood. The fact that that was something that was should be seen as a positive, I thought was a really big deal. And the second part of that that I thought was interesting too was that there were moments with the moderator where there was a kind of casual exchange in Spanish, almost the as moderator. if, yeah, almost <laughs> as if we lived in like a bilingual country where people should be expected to speak Spanish. And that to me seems like a real positive development on the national stage, even as people were mocking it on uh, social media and stuff Which this people morning. want to do. Yeah, which that's and, what they do. Yeah, yeah it's, um, and also um, I want to remind people that Telemundo is one of the fastest growing media outlets um, in the country, and it's been for quite a while, yeah. millions and millions, and they help sponsor the, mm -hmm. the debate, which again goes back to the strategic decisions that the Democratic Party has made this time around. Um, a dumpster fire of the last <laughs> presidential election was that we had a person at the top of the ticket, Hillary Clinton, that was bashed and battered by another member of the party. Mm -hmm. And if you look at uh, uh, presidential elections in the past, you can do an economic model, mm -hmm. there are two things that really work against a candidate. One is if their party has already been in office two terms. So Hillary Clinton had a real disadvantage going into the election because Obama had held office for two years. Mm -hmm. So the incumbent party is always um, a disadvantage. But being battered in your primary will really hurt the top of the ticket candidate. So the Democratic Party, very early on, with their new leadership of Tom Perez, mm -hmm. um, who used to be the labor secretary for, um, um, for Obama, decided that we're going to have a process where we are going to project unity mm -hmm. and that we're going to test all of our candidates about who can beat Trump. Mm -hmm. Remember, that's right. the goal here, right. not celebrity or surprise. Mm -hmm. Or I was quite moved right. by Julian Castro and actually Tim Ryan. But it doesn't really matter if I'm mm -hmm. moved by a point or the green economy plans. Mm -hmm. It really matters who can win. So they picked a process. Like, we're having this debate a year early. We're having a debate with probably 15 more people than they would have allowed before. <laughs> so what we are seeing is a party fighting for its future. Mm -hmm. And so I want everyone to remember that in the 400 some days up into the election. And I think that was very apparent last night. I was actually surprised at how uncombative it was, like with the exception of the fight between Tim Ryan and Tulsi Gabbard about uh, 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 Al Qaeda and the Taliban. Yeah, the rest of it really projected a coherence and very and a unity, I think, and a, a sort of decided a decision not to engage in that kind of like intense ganging up on or fighting. I'm very curious to see what happens tonight, though, because I think that Bernie Sanders has a very different kind of. Um, um, approach to this kind of issue, and we saw that certainly in 2016. So we'll see the way that um, that plays out there. Oh, Bernie Sanders is going after Warren. Yeah, somebody who is his comrade in mm -hmm. arms on on 99.9 mm -hmm. percent of their policies. So it's it's uh, I don't understand him. And, and I think the party. Sorry, yeah. continue. No, yeah, no, go ahead. Just that I mean, he has a reputation of not being the burn the house down 
senator mm -hmm. um, that you know you actually can hear Senator Schumer say that actually he can be quite collaborative yeah. though he doesn't ever move legislation mm -hmm. there isn't a piece of legislation that Bernie Sanders has been associated with yeah. um, so I'm surprised with him but we want to talk yeah. about what we're going to see tonight? Can well, we no, I just wanted to say, I think yeah. also with him, there's a real question about his kind of allegiance to party, right? Uh, so much of his platform has been about cri criticizing, sometimes rightly, Absolutely. the Democratic Party. And I think that that is something that we can't really separate from his ability to be the Democratic Party candidate, particularly when they need to get away from that fractiousness, you know? And I think we saw a decision to get away from that fractiousness fractiousness last night. We'll see what happens with that this evening. Well, and maybe we can talk about I, I, another question that I'm very interested in is, were there any issues that you both feel were not discussed last night that you would have liked to hear more from? I was kind of surprised given the diversity on the stage mm -hmm. that we didn't uh, touch more on identity politics mm -hmm. or, or people mm. seem to keep that mm. suppressed a bit. And I wonder if tonight's contenders will discuss issues more. I, I know that some people mm -hmm. were uh, in in the times they felt that we didn't spend a lot of time on foreign policy, for example. So I thought foreign policy more than race, at least in terms True. of black white relations. I mean, we had Cory Booker, I thought in a you know notable difference from say Obama kind of really reiterating, I'm of the black candidate. I come from an African American neighborhood, but it was very much a kind of personal story dimension. Of course, issues of kind of Af race from an African-American perspective came up when there was talk about police brutality, but I thought that the the mo the way that race really came out primarily was around the border and around um, people, Latino people. So I was surprised that wasn't a bigger focus, maybe this evening, I don't know. Oh, I was really surprised that jobs and quality um, and quality jobs mm -hmm. um, was, was not a, a bigger issue. It right. could be because we're in a very unusual time um, in the economy where anybody who wants a job can get one, that's not their problem. Mm -hmm. The problem is the quality of jobs. Um, Tim Ryan, Jay Inslee were the only ones who consistently talked about uh, providing structures so that when people go to work, they'll get equal wages mm -hmm. and they will get more wages and more of a share. Even Warren sort of um, sideswiped mm -hmm. the idea mm -hmm. of um, employers should pay more. So Jay Inslee was the first person to talk about unions, which is the only way workers get any bargaining power against those corporations we're all talking about. The only way. Look at every country that's a capitalist country, the only ones where there's shared prosperity is where there is organized labor. Mm -hmm. So only Inslee and Ryan um, understood yeah. that. Um, it was actually Ryan that talked about, and, and Julian Castro talked mm -hmm. about the uh, wage equity issues. But remember, the election will be held when the economy is not going to look like this. Mm -hmm. And so we have to, right. we have to, to kind of look at a lens about who among the candidates will be able to articulate an economic agenda mm -hmm. when we are going into probably a recession mm -hmm. a around next summer. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think the Federal Reserve, I can go on and on about <laughs> this and I won't, but the Federal Reserve does seem like a dysfunctional family member that has to actually enable mm -hmm. um, Trump's damage to the economy. Um, and they may actually accommodate by lowering the interest rates, but it's not going to be that powerful mm -hmm. to prevent a slowdown when we come to the election. So we have actually Ensley and Ryan talking about the um, Green New Deal that mm -hmm. was there. And I expected more from it's Warren. True. Yes, on the climate, climate yeah. also, I, I feel, wasn't as uh, yeah, grand yeah. a topic as I thought it would be. Which is surprising, especially because when they closed with that, like, know, you know, right. 10 seconds on what's the, the biggest drama facing, uh, facing the U.S., and it was China, which is largely about yeah. the economy, and climate change, which came up kind of yeah. again and again. So I think it is surprising that that didn't, um, you the know, come through come more. Yeah. Well, and Teresa, I know that you, you specialize so specifically in uh, retirement um, yeah. around the economy. <laughs> and <laughs> and so I, I wonder where, you know, there are some candidates, like I, I think Elizabeth Warren has sort of made it a, a mission of hers to talk about breaking up the big corporations like Facebook, and mm -hmm. et cetera. And so is that a, comp a, a legitimate component of helping to better some of these job situations that we have and the yeah. wage disparity, or is that not a great yeah, tactic a, in your perspective? It, uh, sorry, sorry, no, sorry, I stepped on you. But um, um, I think there is kind of a reformation moment. 
where when Martin Luther said the dominance of the Catholic Church and the framework of the Catholic Church is not going to help you, human, um, humans mm -hmm. progress, we are seeing a reformation in the Democratic Party among all the electorate, mm -hmm. is that there is too much power concentrated among the elites. Corporations was the, um, were the proxy for that, mm -hmm. but it was um, not, a, there was no link in terms of Warren about how you get from that framework mm -hmm. to actually a shared prosperity. I just mm -hmm. didn't hear it. Mm -hmm. um, the other part of the question was? Um, just the, if, if we thought that. Oh, the, the old, oh, the, the, so um, if we look at the electorate, if, you know, if we're in the back room of the Democratic Party and we have a map of the country mm -hmm. and we have places where we have to win and the demographic groups that we have to win, it is people over 55. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the median voter in the Democratic primaries in New York City is average age of 55. Since the whole country is really aging, the average age of the voter is much higher than the average age of the, Interesting. Of the population. Mm -hmm. But the dog whistles that you heard, you know, the, mm -hmm. the message that um, wasn't direct but was received by that, the older demographic was prescription drugs. Absolutely. So, so you didn't need Social Security or you didn't really need pensions to be explicit. But the concern about the cost of medication mm -hmm. is something that really affects people, even if they're on Medicare. Mm -hmm. uh, and the really weird moment was when the moderator said, who is here for Medicare for all? You had the candidates that aren't going to win raise their hand. <laughs> <laughs> but it turns out that almost everybody there is a Medicare for all. Booker is co-sponsoring is co mm -hmm. the bill, and he didn't raise his hand. Yeah. So that's a very odd issue is how health care that won the 2018 move from a Republican House to mm -hmm. a Democratic House is going to be played in this election. I'm not sure yet how that's going to play out. Yeah, I think that it's very unclear, particularly on health care. And also, we didn't, haven't talked about education, largely, because they haven't oh, talked yeah. about education. Exactly, that was it. <laughs> right? And here we are yeah, at the here we are at the new school. Cost of education, yep. we're expensive school. But I think that there is a kind of hesitation to raise your hand, literally or figuratively, for these kind of mass overhaul um, projects, which, in, which give so much power to the state. Because I do think, even in the Democratic Party, the party of big government, the party of the New Deal, the great mm. society, there is this, like, do I really want to get on board with that? Is that really the candidate that I want to be? Even as we've seen, I think, a surprising allegiance to those surprisingly left policies with Sanders, with Warren more so. But I still think there is a kind of pause after years of kind of Clintonianism, of kind of market liberalism, which have proved to be, you know, the rule of the day. So we'll see. But. Oh, the big loser in the debate. Yes. The big loser in the debate was austerity economics, mm, or austerity yeah. politics. Can you unpack that for us? <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, well, well, we started, um, yeah, I think you started yeah. talking about how Warren had a, a lot of of proposals um, that she wanted, and there was a follow-up on it. Yes, everybody, even Amy Klobuchar, says everybody should have quality mm -hmm. health care. Um, and there wasn't anybody saying, well, how are you going to pay for it? Which is the austerity right. um, economics uh, like yes. response. They, they wear t-shirts that say, mm -hmm. well, how are you going to pay for it? Because the Democratic Party is answering that question mm -hmm. in, its, um, in its bones, which is, we have plenty of money. I think it was Tim Ryan, the mm -hmm. most conservative. He did. He did the, say yeah, this. Yeah, the we most conservative money. person um, there and the person who was very establishment in the House of Representatives. I mean, there are a few people there who had jobs, and many of them were unemployed, mm -hmm. right? But Tim Ryan has a <laughs> job, and his job is very practical to get legislation, and he answered the question, there's plenty of money out there. Um, we just have to tax it. That's extraordinary. Mm -hmm. So austerity economics really is the big loser um, in this. And I think that was not a foregone conclusion, even when the debate, yes. the way it started, when Savannah Guthrie basically like present, presented this 70% proposed tax. Right. It's like, do you really believe that? This crazy idea, even though that has not historically been a crazy idea. And I think you could have imagined the debate going in, in, in a way where the Democrats would be playing defense of like, we're going to find the money to pay for it, or like, it's not that expensive, or I don't really believe in that rate. But I think you're right that it moved away from, you know, austerity was not on the table, at least last night. Can you talk more about um, this idea about paying for 
um, education mm -hmm. is a big state idea. That well, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, one of the things that I have been really troubled by is that, you know, I studied, uh, I've written about the uh, public schools in the United States in the 1960s and 70s as being this very contested space, mm -hmm. right? Contested space across the political spectrum, on the far left, on conservative Christians, et cetera. By the late 1970s, when you have these tax revolts, mm -hmm. right, and this kind of gutting of state programs, you actually see particularly a lot of conservatives saying, well, we don't even want public schools. What we want is vouchers. What we want is tax um, provisions that allow Christian schools to be much cheaper. And to me, that's kind of the prehistory of what we see today, where you have you know, someone like Betsy DeVos who doesn't even, um, someone like Betsy DeVos who doesn't even really believe public schools are a meaningful um, yeah. institution. And I actually, you know, you can easily mm -hmm. see how that comes out of kind of a conservative conservative economic mm. vision, but honestly, the kind of um, warm embrace of privately run charter schools among Democrats is also very much part of that mm. problem, and to me speaks to that larger gutting mm. of a public commitment to education. So that's why I think, you know, the talking point uh. last night, to the extent it was one, was about uh. free college, which is very important, but like, let's have this conversation about K through 12, that's or really PK good. through 12, because that has not really been as much of a, an issue. And I have to say, I was so surprised that de Blasio, who came off pretty well, our hometown he boy. Sure did. Yes, exactly. He, I thought so that he what? would make more <laughs> of universal pre-K because that has been a big deal here in New York City. Personally, I've benefited from it. And also as a policy matter that yeah. he faced a lot of resistance about um, not yeah. means testing for that, right? And yeah. universal pre-K for everyone. And I think as a policy um, norm, like he did that even though, in part because, you know, when you have these programs that are for everybody, they tend to go much mm. better than if it's just for poor people and they mm. quickly get gutted and kind of orphaned. So I'll, I could go on for a long time. Like no, no, I, I thought you could <laughs> and I really wanted to hear it. So, but you reminded me that Booker has um, really tried to make a, a claim in the Democratic Party to be for charter right. store, um, schools, yeah. to invite um, contributions from Facebook. I remember, uh, Facebook million Foundation. to Newark, right? Yeah, to Newark. Uh, yeah. And that was, it was supposed to be rich people who the Democrats had just recently venerated mm -hmm. for providing um, Bloomberg Foundation gun control, um, Zuckerberg um, Chang for uh, for school control because those unions and those public schools mm -hmm. aren't doing the job. You didn't hear any of that from the new so-called Democrats who now may be old. Right. You hear uh, a celebration of state um, and state and local community colleges. Mm -hmm. That was the first thing Kobachar talked I about. I know. I was, I was flattened shocked by that. Shocked in a good way. Yeah, you know? it, shocked in a good way. It was very specific. Mm -hmm. um, now, the United States has, has always wanted privately funded colleges, mm -hmm. um, a, as, a, as opposed to the, sort of the public employment of German mm -hmm. um, right. um, um, professors, where the new school actually started when the German government fired their Jewish professors because they're public employees. Mm -hmm. So there's always been a sense that, that private schools should be well endowed, it should mm -hmm. be independent, because that's freedom from the state. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, but we now may have swung too far mm -hmm. that the Harvards and Yales and Princeton's get $150 million gifts and mm -hmm. we get a $15,000 gift or the University of California mm -hmm. gets a $10,000 gift. So I think the party is recognizing that we've swung way too far away from yeah. public schools and now need to go back. I think it actually, I mean, I was so taken with the community college comment and I think that it would be a very positive thing if anti-elitism around education in the Democratic mm. Party played out by bolstering nice. educational institutions for people who have less means. Whereas we see on the right that anti-elitism tends to be like, oh, all you people who are into book learning and like mm -hmm. got the whole thing, right? But I think there's a hope for a kind of smarter and well-guided anti-elitism that says, well, we need to put more, more money into state schools, into community colleges. Yeah. And I think we've seen some of that conversation coming out of philanthropic circles where you know there is a kind of raised eyebrows mm -hmm. about, giving millions of dollars to universities that have huge endowments because of course there's a prestige, right, that comes with yeah. doing that. And it's, you know, what could CUNY do with that? What could state mm -hmm. colleges do with that? And I'm hoping that that gets amplified in the, in the 2020 election because I think it's really important. So optimistic. I know. <laughs> I know because yeah. there might be talk about that and there's yeah. a, three good books about the elitism of, mm -hmm. of foundations. I mean, we're the only sort of country that gives big tax breaks mm -hmm. to the rich 
to give to their own idiosyncratic um, desires, which of course the taxpayers pay for because we don't get revenue from mm -hmm. their tax breaks. Why is it that what Bloomberg or Zuckerberg you know, want to fund becomes something that we have to fund indirectly? That's right. Um, I don't expect um, charitable given, giving yeah. to anywhere to be a challenge in the Democratic election. Yeah, and I, I don't know. think that that's the answer. I mean, yeah. then we start getting to yeah. the points of light argument, right? If people just gave more, we'd be fine. We don't need policy. So I don't mean well, to go in that well, direction. Well, no, no. So uh, yeah. actually, I think for our viewers, they may not know your oh, reference. Sure, go ahead. To, to, no, no, yeah, yeah, go yeah. ahead. So uh, this idea that from the George Bush, Bush, yeah, from yeah, the, the Bush first Bush administration, the first Bush administration, that you know, if we had like each gift can be a point of light, and then if we kind of in, encourage a culture of private giving, then you don't have to have such an expansive yeah. state. I'm like explaining this to you. Yeah, yeah, uh, such yeah, an yeah. expansive state um, that that has to actually fund education yeah. or these other social programs, and that's warm and fuzzy and I think people mm -hmm. should give and mm -hmm. philanthropy is important in a society like ours but it is a really dangerous to think that that would be the answer to some of our you know education for example and, and so just to just to wrap yeah. up your point and I think we're seeing that instead yeah. of um, cajoling the rich to give more charity we see the Democratic Party standing up for justice yeah because charity is very different than justice Absolutely. and what's Absolutely. just yeah, what is just is a um, well-funded, mm -hmm. um, high-quality public spaces, mm -hmm. Absolutely. In including education. And we heard a little bit, I guess, again, from Kolbachar talking about what a public option is. Um, and she had a roadmap, like an executive would have, about how you get to a high-quality a high Medicare or Medicaid for all. Mm -hmm. You don't do it overnight, but you actually have the a well um, um, a well-funded public option to compete against these eroding private insurers mm -hmm. and pretty soon you get to Medicare mm -hmm. or, or a single payer. Mm -hmm. So again, that was a platform for her, but to go back to this bigger point, Natalia mm -hmm. really brought it up, that we see a Democratic Party lifting up the public yeah. and saying we have money to pay for it. Yeah, and that is a significant change. It's a say. huge change, yeah. right? Even Hillary Clinton was worried about in her plans Absolutely. for pay fors. Yeah. She put pay fors in all of her plans, mm -hmm. like you're supposed to do. That was mm -hmm. been our culture um, in government, no matter who's in power, mm -hmm. that you propose a plan, and then with that plan, you have the Office of Management and Budget mm -hmm. score it. These are right. all insider sort of habits mm -hmm. and cultures. And we're seeing the Democratic Party sort of breaking out of that habit and culture Absolutely. by saying, we know where the money is, and you all do too. Yeah. Oh. Well, last sort of question was, you know, because we've, we've talked a lot about, it's, it's so interesting to hear both of you comment on, on various candidates, because I feel that I was very swayed by the, uh, the swells of, of, again, narrative or personality. Um, mm -hmm. But more in terms of, for example, I, I felt that Elizabeth Warren came off, while perhaps she didn't um, articulate as uh, she has previously done, uh, this is how I'm going to get this done, though her tagline is, I have a plan for that. Yeah. Um, but mm -hmm. I, I felt she, mm -hmm. she just seemed so eager to, she looks like she wanted to just jump in and get the job That's done great. Al already, yeah. right? That's great. And so are, do we see any um, differences between, for example, candidates who really know their stuff and spoke to that last night and said, well, this is how mm -hmm. I would do this, versus uh, how we galvanize the, the youth vote and other votes like the average voter mm -hmm. with, well, I just, I don't care about what that guy said. I don't know who he is and I don't like him, right? So there's that, I, mm -hmm. I think about that so much with yeah. getting people out to vote. So. I don't know. Do we do we mm. think that any candidate hit that the the both and there or tonight maybe someone else will? I know that's a long. <laughs> no. So I don't know. Right. So who has a plan and the personality? Right. I'm not sure. Last night. I mean, I think we were chatting a little yeah. before, and I think Amy Klobuchar did amazing on she the was plan, so great. Um, and she had a kind of very. I thought she inspired a lot of confidence. I think it was in a way we. I, I sort of already assumed about Elizabeth Warren, but I didn't necessarily know about her. Um, but I was impressed with her. It is scary to think about, you know, who could like inspire people to get off their couch and actually make it to the polls. Um, I do think that some of the candidates that have traditionally, that last night have traditionally been kind of celebrated for their personality, O'Rourke and Cory Booker. I mean, 
you know, they are credible people, but I do, I think that I'm hoping we're moving past a moment where we think that's all you need. And I, I think already, so already the criticism mm -hmm. has really punctured the Beto bubble in yeah. many ways, yeah. rightly so. Um, and Booker as well, although I don't know, they could come back. So I hate to predict the future, I'm a historian. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Um, yeah. Um, uh, on, the, on the personalities again, I think um, a way we can uh, reflect on last night's um, debate and the way we can actually analyze um, this tonight's debate is to sort of look at all the lists and say what job are they applying for right, uh, right, and right. I hope That's that Beto original. actually um, has enough power to win back his um, congressional yeah, seat because so yeah. I'm not I, I, so I think we I can we could hope for all of their futures in the Democratic mm -hmm. Party they were all credible and, and, and yeah. unusual I want to go back to this other issue about who votes who has to vote, don't think, and I used to think this a lot, um, and I uh, sometimes think it again, but it's wrong, is that somehow an idea or a line is going to cause someone to vote or um, not vote for the party they usually vote for. Mm -hmm. We really have to understand who votes and why. Mm -hmm. Most people vote um, for their party. Most people don't vote. <laughs> That's most people don't vote. Mm -hmm. um, and so there's two issues here is how do you get people to come out to vote for their party? And that's a very different electorate than what you just mentioned, young people. So mm -hmm. let's talk about people under 30. Mm -hmm. We know a lot about them. They are a small share of every electorate for the presidency, about 10%. Their voter turnout is about flat. It's always about um, 30, 40% no matter what. The real difference that the youth vote makes is which party they voted mm -hmm. for. And the only election where the youth mattered was Obama, mm -hmm. where the youth that usually vote, there wasn't a big um, difference in their voting participation or their percentage of the votes for the party at all. But what really shifted is they moved away from independent, from green, from Republican, and they went right to the Democratic Party. So the job for the youth vote is um, to make sure those who vote, for the Democratic Party, I mean, that they vote Democratic. Mm -hmm. um, the most important thing about voting isn't about the celebrity or who says what when. It's about whether or not we have same day registration yeah. um, and, that, um, and that we have mail-in registration. And I was surprised, we talked Absolutely. about this, that voting rights in democracy totally. was not an issue. I expect that from Peter Buttigieg yeah, um, tonight. Yes. tonight. Mm -hmm. um, and that was the idea of democracy being stolen from us. Who said it was Russia was our problem? Was it oh, Tim Ryan? De Blasio. De Blasio. Yeah. yeah. Like, this is Russia. My, this is my only thing I can do. Yeah. But, but there was something to that. Yeah. That there's been an undermining of our democracy in a way that threatens all those plans. Right, but not, and not just from abroad, right? I actually think with voter registration, that gets right back to the race issue mm -hmm. that I thought was underplayed as well. Like exactly. this widespread, you know, the surgical precision of the voting districts and the kind of widespread suppression of registration, which I think is a huge deal. Yeah. The kind of fanning the flames of like these people who are doing committing voter fraud. I, yeah, hopefully that'll come up tonight. I, I know it, it has yeah. to. I mean, it's it's really security, mm -hmm. it's really freedom, and it's in it's it's also democracy. Yeah. And those are the values. Um, that the Democratic Party really can differ itself yeah. from the Republican Party. I'm hoping, I was thinking about this on the, on the subway, is that I hope this is the election where I don't hear from people, ah, oh, those parties are all the same. Right. <laughs> I think so this is not, we're not gonna hear that. Yeah. And I'm also thinking that there isn't really room for a third party here. That the Democratic Party is now one that's going to embrace a lot of views. Like 20 candidates. <laughs> and yeah. have a process for those views. Right. So there isn't sort of an anointed, mm -hmm. or like it's Biden's turn, or he's done so. Yeah, we saw that didn't work last it's time, not, right? It's not, it didn't work last time, yeah. and I, and I am a interested. a lot to answer to tonight. Tonight. Yeah. 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 And also that, that, um, that presumed privilege is he's going to have to answer mm -hmm. to, regardless of other, his other positions, is there's maybe no more elder states persons right. in the Democratic Party anymore. Mm -hmm. So we may not have to have um, a spoiler. Yeah. You know, we may, we may, the Democratic we, I'm a Democrat, yeah. so I use that word, but I don't mean to mean that. There are lots of 
people in the new school community that aren't mm -hmm. Democrats and many who are Republicans. Mm -hmm. But if the Democratic Party wants to win, it has to make sure there isn't um, a third party candidate on the left. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, if we didn't have a third party dem uh, candidate in Wisconsin and Pennsylvania and Michigan, this time Hillary Clinton would be president. Right. Um, just because we are here in uh, college, yes. right? And because you were mentioning about you thinking about the youth vote in a more complicated mm -hmm. way. I was taken when Amy Klobuchar said, you know, if 17 year olds are telling us what to do with our policy, oh, like that's a good thing. That. And you know, one of them- Invested by a bunch of Exactly, <laughs> you know the quote. And I thought even like, you know, the, the mm. moderators alluded to the fact that they were right near the Parkland shooting exactly. when that happened. And I do, I'm very curious to see the way that kind of youth politics and mobilization plays out in 20. 20 because I think we are in a different moment. We've seen a real upsurge of yeah, high school kids even mm -hmm. and college kids. And I think at a place like the new school, although you're right, it is politically mm -hmm. diverse, we see more of the progressive activism. But I also think we have to be very um, aware of not being too sanguine about the fact that just because you're young, you vote progressive. We've also Absolutely. seen a real, I mean, you know, YouTube and Jordan Peterson and kind of this like mm -hmm. mass online awakening of a kind of conservative young person who is like horrified by social justice warriors and mm -hmm. really mobilized by someone like mm -hmm. Trump and what he stands for. There's something to really think about as well, even as mm -hmm. though you're right, historically young people, if they vote, tend to to vote. Um, I don't know if you said that, yeah. but that is true. Yeah, they tend to vote progressive. No, I did. Yeah. Uh, well, yeah. well, they don't. But, but in Obama, they did. In Obama, they uh, did. Well, yeah, yeah. Um, I, um, I, I really have um, to point out that I think it was my sort of Midwestern white guy, I, you know, yeah. uh, um, who might have said that we have to care for the dignity of the individual. Yeah. Now that was a placeholder for something the Democratic Party really has to um, make sure that they address. Mm -hmm is that we have democracy, but we also you know, have a liberal tradition mm -hmm. um, where, where an individual is expected to have personal responsibility. Yeah. I'll borrow those terms <gasps> from the Republican How dare party. you say that, Teresa? Right. <laughs> because, that, because that actually work does confer yeah. you know, uh, uh, um, self-reliance and personal dignity, mm -hmm. and that gives people meaning yeah. um, and a sense, a sense of control. So um, I think that's going to be a very, um, a very important value that the Democratic Party articulate. I didn't hear it last night. No, and your Midwestern white guy, Tim Ryan, I mean, I have followed him for a long time because I'm interested in wellness and kind of meditation, and he's been this big advocate for what he's called the yoga vote, right? Which sounds like a punchline and maybe sort of yes. is. But I think exactly what you're talking about, reclaiming this notion of personal responsibility, not as some like horrible right-wing, unforgiving mm -hmm. attitude, but as part of, you know, being a full person and citizen and part of a, part of a collective I think is really important and I actually do think the language he did not really use so last night but the language that he has used in the past of kind of being reflective and about and introspective can actually be very very valuable in this process and make it appealing um, in a more politically um, inclusive way. Um, l let's just talk about the country for a minute yeah. because he comes from ground zero mm -hmm. of the failure of capitalism to yeah. help uh, American people. Um, he comes from an area of Youngstown that um, General Motors just closed a, a plant that was 4,000 people of the um, engine of growth, not of just those families, but of the whole area. Mm -hmm. And he said something that just gave me chills, is that what you're talking about, everybody here, about dislocation and not shared prosperity has been happening in our area for 40 years. Oh, I remember when you, you know, said that. Oh, I also got chills. It was, uh, right. And, and Heart-wrenching fact. Yeah, um, and 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 so and that with that decline comes a um, an, an unwinding of the dignity of the individual. If you can't Absolutely. be someone who cares about their family and community and work hard and still not make it and be downwardly mobile every single year, your children are downwardly mobile, and as you get older, you're going to fall into poverty. Then there's no dignity there. And mm -hmm. it's so interesting that he is response to that mm -hmm. loss and that assault. Mm -hmm. It isn't like they were left behind. They were like pushed back. Yeah. Is collective action mm -hmm. in this kind of yoga way yeah. is 
makes him very fascinating. I think so or too. Or those politics fascinating. Yeah, I think so too. Um, we'll see how resonant it is. I mean, I kind of wanted him and Marianne Williamson <laughs> to be on the stage together oh, because they're both they're they're very <laughs> different. I didn't even um, know about her. Oh, I she um, yeah. Um, I mean, she'll be on there tonight. But she had run for Congress and lost in in L.A. And I had written about that when she did a few years ago because you know the lines in the mainstream media was like, no, this is not a joke. And I actually mm. think this was before I was really paying attention to Tim Ryan. But I think, I mean, she's very religious and she's, mm -hmm. I think, probably, I mean, she's not a real contender for this. Mm -hmm. But I do think, and what I said mm -hmm. then, I said now, is this kind of like new age sensibility that brings a more humanistic approach to mm. personal responsibility and individualism while um, keenly aware of nice. the responsibility to a whole and of humanity mm. and of love, even at the mm -hmm. risk of sounding too woo woo, is really something mm -hmm. that we need. And um, yeah, yeah, so. I think it's important. Well, yeah, love is a good antidote to the kind of hate. Right. That's, a, that's really an interesting contrast. And I think it might be actually more um, resonant now, given like the moral failings that we're seeing. I mean, children in cages at the border oh. is Wow. Something that you have to be an ogre not to feel something about, to feel you know hurt and pain about. So I do think that um, you know that might move out of the realm of either like new agey crazy mm -hmm. or like hardcore yeah. religious and something that doesn't yeah. belong in politics. There might be a space for that. Um, I, I'm wondering what we all three think the tagline for the Democratic Party should be. Oh gosh, should oh, man. you're should, a marketing yeah, person? Yeah. Should, it, should it be? I have a plan for that. Or I have a value for that. Uh, that's well. Perhaps this is a. I know we're running short of time. This could be a, a potential framing for our next episode, and maybe <laughs> both of you can come back, or and we can have right. some additional faculty to parse Pitch. that out because I, I think that's a really great well, question. Or, um, or people who might be listening yeah, or, yeah. or watching, if they could have a, we could have a contest. What's the tagline for oh, the Democratic Party? So, if your viewers, if you're watching and you are also familiar with Twitter, uh, both of these uh, faculty members are prominent Twitter. Uh, Tweeters, I should say. <laughs> um, so Natalia is at Natalia Petrozella, right? Exactly. And Teresa, you're at T. Gillard. Yeah, yeah. Um, and we will post those in the comments um, and link to them as well. Uh, thank you so much for this. Thank big, you. I mean, we have a, we have a lot to think about. Right. Yeah. There's a lot to think well, about. A lot to watch tonight, tonight yes. for yes. too. Oh, Which jobs are they applying for? Exactly. Is my, and that's <laughs> a great I framing. Think that's the new theme yeah. of the Democratic Party. <laughs> exactly. Thank you all so much for thank watching. Thank you. Tune in next time.